Hello and good afternoon and welcome today to today's installment of the 2020 January series. My name is Anna Singh and I'm a junior here at Calvin from Battle Creek, Michigan and I'm studying biology and Spanish. Would you please take a moment to silence your cell phones please? As you are doing so, I would like to welcome our guests at all 60 of our remote viewing locations, including Escondido, California, Muskegon, Michigan, Grand Junction, Colorado, and Burlington, Ontario. We're so grateful that you are viewing with us today. And now, would you please join me as we open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you have crafted for each one of us. We recognize that all is created by you, Lord, and you have blessed us with this wonderful earth to call home. As followers of Christ, it is our responsibility to act as stewards of the creation. I pray, Father, that you help guide us in the process of restoring and reconciling our world for future generations. Thank you for bringing Sandra here today and bless her as she speaks to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Now, David Wonder, Professor of Engineering and Dean for Faculty Development, will introduce our guest. It's often said that water is life. This is the focus of our speaker, Sandra Postel, whose life work is water. Sandra is all about water and its critical connection as a sustained and preserved source of life in the built and natural environment. In fact, this is her focus as director of the Global Water, Pro water Policy Project, promoting the preservation of Earth's fresh water. She is co-creator of Change the Course, a national water stewardship initiative that catalyzes the transformation of the way society uses, manages, and values fresh water. For its work, Change the Course was awarded the 2017 U.S. Water Prize. She holds degrees from Wittenberg and Duke Universities, along with several honorary Doctor of Science degrees, a prolific writer of articles and books for both public and academic audiences. She is also routinely featured in radio and television programs and various specials that seek to better understand water's crucial role in the world. She will be available to greet the audience in the West Lobby of the Covenant Fine Arts Center following the presentation where copies of her book, Replenish, the virtuous cycle of water and prosperity will also be available for purchase. Calvin University is grateful to, to World Renew and the Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome Sandra Postel. Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for coming out today to talk with me and think with me about my favorite topic, fresh water. Very much appreciate you being here. It's interesting to me that my re most recent book on fresh water, Replenish, which is the fourth book I've written, <clears throat> was the most optimistic book, perhaps, that I've written. Even though the trends had done nothing but get worse during the time I'd been researching and writing about water, and the reason is that you know, having spent some six years uh, working with National Geographic as their freshwater fellow, I had the opportunity to go into the field and examine projects and see that through collaboration and cooperation, building bridges uh, across communities, that we could actually solve these problems. As we're going to see in a minute, the water cycle is badly broken. I'm going to walk you through the ways it's broken. But what I learned is that innovation collaboration can help us come up with solutions to fix this problem. And so I came to write Replenish from that experience from a place of what I would call realistic optimism. You know, I have a lot of pessimistic days about the trends I'm about to present to you. And be clear, I'm going to get to solutions. You know, the, the beginning of this talk is going to be a bit of a downer, okay? But then we're going to come up and look at solutions. But I realize that every one of these problems has a solution that's already being implemented. It's already happening somewhere out in the world. And so that gives me a grounding of 
honest hope, realistic optimism that we can, that we can solve these problems. So having said that, I want to thank Calvin University, first off, for inviting me to be part of this January series, which looks like a phenomenal series, um, great, great topics, great speakers, and I'm very, very honored and privileged to be, to be one of them this year. Okay, so let's, let's dive in and take a quick look at, at what's happening. Some of you may recognize this photo. It was taken by the astronauts of the Apollo 8 mission just over half century ago in, in 1968, actually Christmas Eve, December 24th. And the beaming back of this photograph to Earth really changed our thinking about this planet that we live on and share. If you think about what happened after 1968, the first Earth Day was 1970. The Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. The Endangered Species Act in 1973. We suddenly saw our Earth, our home, yes, as this vulnerable planet in space, in the darkness, but also as this water-rich planet. It's a gem, right, of blue and white circling there in space. And it is the basis of life. Water is the basis of life. When we travel to Jupiter's moons or our own moon or to Mars, what are we looking for? We're looking for water. We are incredibly lucky, right, to live on this water-wealthy planet. But as many of you know, most of that water is fresh water. Only 2.5%. Excuse me, most of this water is salt water. Only 2.5% is fresh water. And most of that is locked up in glaciers and ice caps. So less than 1% is fresh and accessible to us for the things we need to grow our food, to make all the products we see in this room for drinking. So that's a precious supply, and it's finite, okay? That water is finite. And this is a hard concept. We're thinking about a water cycle, which makes it seem infinite but it's a finite supply that cycles, okay? And that's a very important concept because our demands for water are not finite. So we're, we're, we have this increasing demand as our population and economies grow, our needs for consumption grow, but it's against a finite supply. And just think about the amount of water it takes to make very simple things. How many of us have a cotton shirt on today? Probably most of us, right? It can take as much as 700 gallons of water to make one cotton shirt. Most of those gallons are used to grow the cotton out in the field. Crops are very, very thirsty um, and have to transpire a fair amount of water to photosynthesize. So almost any time we're using water in agriculture, it's a surprisingly large amount, 700 gallons for a cotton shirt. Hopefully we've had some lunch, maybe not. Delicious margarita pizza can take as much as 330 gallons of water to make. Again, most of that is in the cheese and the tomatoes and the basil, right? The things that are, that are grown in the field. And so if we multiply all of these gallons times the billions of consumer meals and products that we're consuming every day, it becomes easy to understand, I think, easier to understand why we have a map of global water depletion that's getting redder and redder with each passing year. This map would have looked very different when I started working on global water issues, what, 35 years ago. And look where it is. The red shows where the depletion is most severe, the deeper red, where we're in an annual state of depletion. Supplies are being taken out of the earth and not put back in. We have seasonal depletion, we have drought-related depletion. But most of the areas that we need to grow our food are in those red zones, okay? So that's a concern for the future. If you think about groundwater depletion, most of those deeply red areas are areas where we're depleting groundwater. 10% of our food today comes from the unsustainable use of groundwater, and that number is increasing. Well, how are we going to fix that? How are we going to have enough food in the future if we're depleting, in a sense, we're using tomorrow's, today's, excuse me, tomorrow's water to meet our food demands today. That's not a good picture for, for the future generations. And so we have a lot of signs of this depletion on the ground. Here's the Rio Grande. Doesn't look much like a river right there. 
Here's the Murray, which is the lifeline in southeastern Australia. Here's the Colorado. I'm sure many of you know the Colorado no longer reaches the sea. The last 90 miles of the Colorado look pretty much like this. Some of you may be familiar with what once was the fourth largest lake in the world, the Aral Sea. We're sitting right here by Lake Michigan. Imagine, this is an inland lake. In 30 years, it's lost nearly all of its water. Again, diversions of water largely to grow cotton in the desert. Worldwide, we have produced now, built now, more than 60,000 large dams. And by large, we mean any dam that's over 45 feet high. Here's the first of those super dams, Hoover Dam, on the Colorado River. It was completed in the 1930s and became sort of the, the engineering miracle of the 20th century and in terms of water that allowed others to duplicate and start to build these big dams on rivers around the world. In a sense, we exported this technology to help others produce dams that could provide many, many benefits, as you'll see here. Hydropower, flood control, irrigation, water supply, recreation. Very, very important benefits. And yet, what it's doing to the river is changing that natural flow. Obviously, you're putting a big blockage in the river, creating a big reservoir. The river is no longer flowing as a river is meant to flow. And so all the habitat and the birds and animals and, and wildlife that depend on that river for habitat suffer as a result. This number, by the way, the 60,000, is, is a fascinating number. I mean, we've been, if you, if you do the math on this, in a sense, we've been building two large dams a day, every day, for half a century. And again, that is an engineering feat um, with tremendous benefits, but think about it from, from the river point of view. It's partly why, right now, we see such grave consequences uh, for freshwater life. This statistic came out uh, just a little over a year ago and pretty much knocked my socks off, to be honest with you. Uh, that since 1970, the average abundance of freshwater vertebrate populations, this is, you know, mammals and reptiles and amphibians and uh, fish, of course, that the population of freshwater vertebrates has declined by 83%. So 50 years ago, when I, when I was a kid, um, for every 100 fish and frogs, that were around then, there's only 17 of them now. And that's, for me, that's really hard to wrap my head around. We're not talking about the extinction of species, although that's happening too, and more species in freshwater are going extinct than on land. We're talking about numbers of things, numbers of fish, numbers of frogs. For every 100 that there were 50 years ago, there are now only 17. That's, that's an astounding loss of life in, 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 in the freshwater environment. This is a colleague, um, Zeb Hogan, who's holding a female Mississippi paddlefish. The paddlefish are related to the sturgeon, right, which have been around since the dinosaurs, um, but they're now vulnerable or at risk of, of extinction as well. We've lost about 50% of the world's wetlands, and with them go their what we call ecosystem services. Now, this is a concept that um, ecologists came up with uh, to help us understand that ecosystems provide services, functions that are of great value to our society, even though we don't tend to put a price on it. So if you think about what a wetland does, it can take nitrogen and phosphorus and treat that water. It can regulate floods by storing it and holding it like a sponge. It creates habitat for birds and wildlife. Helps with fish production. It sequesters carbon. Wetlands are fantastic for sequestering carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in the land. Storing water during floods and mitigating droughts because you're storing water in the land, help, helping you to mitigate against that next drought. We don't tend to put a value, a price, monetary price, on any of these things. And so it's been very easy, right, to drain the wetland, to put in the shopping mall, or what have you. But we've lost these services, and we're coming now to realize that maybe we would have been good to, to protect some of them. 
This is an issue that's rapidly on the rise, toxic algal blooms and the spread of them um, around the world. This one is pretty close to here. You may remember it. Um, in 2014, Toledo, Ohio was dealing with a toxic algal bloom that positioned right over the intake of the city's drinking water supply. Now, as most of you know, the source of these blooms is the nitrogen and phosphorus that's running off the land into creeks, into waterways that then take those nitrogen and phosphorus pollutants to the coastal zones or to lakes. And so we're seeing more and more of these blooms arise and some of them become toxic. It's hard to predict which ones are going to become toxic, but some do. There's a cyanotoxin called microcystin, which our military, the Pentagon, classifies as a potential bio weapon of biological warfare. It can be very toxic, it can be harmful to human health, it has killed dogs and pets. Anyway, sometimes it shows up in these blooms. And this was one of them, where the microcystin showed up in this bloom. So here you have a city of four million people. This toxic bloom has positioned itself right over the water intake for Toledo. What does Toledo do? Of course they have to say, don't drink that water. Don't give that water to your pet. It's, it's harmful. So for several days, about a half a million, quarter of a million, half a million people, I think half a million people in Toledo did not have access to water coming out of their taps. It was unsafe. And partly as a result of this, um, last February, the city of Toledo, the, the residents who went to the voting booth, decided to pass an ordinance that essentially was called the Lake Erie Bill of Rights, that we need to give some rights and some voice, legal voice, to this ecosystem so that we have some power to clean it up and protect our drinking water. It's a very interesting um, new legal development that's happening around, around rights for nature. But it was an extreme response because our existing regulations were not preventing this toxic bloom from happening. And so how are we going to protect the lake and therefore our drinking water? We're hearing a lot these days about what's going on in Australia. We've heard a lot of, about fires in California and other parts of the western U.S. And these are also threats to drinking water. Uh, we had a big fire in New Mexico, uh, where I now live, in 2011, that burned so hot and so fast that it took an acre of wooded land every second for the first 14 hours of the fire. And what happens then is when you get rain after that, all of that sediment, all of that debris, all of those blackened dead tree trunks are going to make their way downstream into creeks and into rivers. In, in our case, Albuquerque had to shut down its water supply rather than risk gunking up the water treatment systems. And so forest fires, the, the mega fires that we're now seeing, are also direct threats to drinking water. And we're going to come back to that. All of these things are happening anyway. That red map has nothing to do with climate change, right? Water stress is happening anyway around the world. But climate change and the impacts of climate change are going to worsen all of these trends that we've just been talking about. We're going to have more intense rainfall. If you think for a second about the physics of, of a warming atmosphere, you can see from the chart there on the right, the atmosphere is warming. The temperature is, is up. Um, we, we seems like every year, practically, we make a new record, right, in terms of warming temperature. As temperatures warm, what air does is it expands. So if you have an expanded volume of air, it can hold more moisture. And so that's why we're seeing more intense rainstorms, right, which leads to more flooding. Also more intense droughts. We call it the evaporative demand of the atmosphere has increased. And so it's pulling more water up from the soil, from reservoirs. So you have more drought. So you have that intensity on both sides, more floods, more droughts, more shortages, glacial melting. The wildfires are increasing because you have hotter temperature and you have more drought. Sea level rise, species extinction, all these things together happening simultaneously. So if you think about climate change, we're largely going to experience it through the water cycle in these various ways. A little over a decade ago, um, a group of eminent scientists from around the world got together and wrote an article that was published in the journal Science that was called Stationarity is Dead. And what that means is 
is that there's a recognition that yes, we have, and we hear this all the time, well, we have droughts, we've always had droughts, we've had floods, we've always had floods. There's naturally variability in the system, and that is absolutely true. What they were saying, these, this group of eight scientists, is that we are now outside the zone of that natural variability. Let me put that differently. If you think about an envelope that goes like this, the highs and lows occurred within that envelope, up and down, up and down, but you pretty much knew you weren't going to go out of it. And now they're saying we're out of it. We can't be sure that we're going to stay within that zone. And so if you're a water manager or a city planner, that's a very, very hard fact to accept because you don't know for sure that that levee is going to hold. If, if the flood can be a lot worse than what you're accustomed to, what is your confidence that that levee is going to hold? What is your confidence that if you build a dam there, it's really going to fill? What is your confidence that you're going to be able to meet your city's water supply needs, drinking water needs, in the future? You don't know. You don't have that level of confidence. So it's, it makes planning very, very hard. Stationarity is dead. It means we need to become more resilient, we need to have um, more protections and more creative solutions to solving our challenges of water security. We got a hint at what this looks like last year, actually now it's two years, um, in Cape Town, South Africa. This, is, this, this all sounds theoretical until it's not, right? Until a city is really grappling with these, with these issues. Just about this time of year in 2018, so two years ago, Cape Town started announcing something it called Day Zero. And what they meant by Day Zero was, sorry everybody, but we're going to have to turn off the taps for all your homes because our reservoir is going to be dry. And they would name a date at which they thought it's going to happen then. And then they move it out a little bit, and then they'd move it out a little bit because people began to conserve. They began to buy some water rights from farmers. But in March, the reservoir looked like this. This is one of their main reservoirs, completely dry. They had had three consecutive years of drought of a magnitude that they had never thought they would have and so hadn't prepared for. Um, and so this, this was, this was a, you know, a happening that was outside of that usual boundary right? The first year of drought, oh, the rains will come back. The second year of drought, they'll surely come back the next time. Third year of drought, and they ran out of water. And so they were saved by the rains coming back just in the nick of time, right? They, they got people to conserve, they purchased some extra water from farmers, and then, thankfully, the rains came back. But it was a wake-up call for every city in the world. This is a modern city, Right? that nearly had to turn off the taps to millions of people. And they had already prepared people. You're going to have to line up at one of you know, a couple hundred watering stations we'll put in place around the city. You know, bring your container. We'll fill you up with enough water to last a few days. And then you come back again. Very, very different way of living. So it caught, it caught everyone's attention. And the scientific community did their analysis and found that the probability of this drought scenario happening had tripled as a result of climate change. And this is a very important concept. We cannot attribute any one event to climate change. We can't say that drought was caused by climate change, that flood was caused by climate change. What we can say, and this is due to a new science of attribution, we, what we can say is that the probability of that drought happening has increased by X amount. In this case, the probability of a drought scenario like this had tripled as a result of climate change. So we're starting to get a sense, yes, we've got to prepare in, for things that we didn't have to prepare for before. Here's a look at what happened in the US in 2017. Some of you may remember, this was the year we had Hurricane Harvey in Texas, we had Hurricane Irma in Florida, and we had Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. We had some really significant wildfires in California, and we got a total bill at the end of the day, also a smattering of tornadoes and droughts and hailstorms, 
collectively adding up to $306 billion. Now, right now, that's an outlier. Our next biggest one, let's see if I can point to that. Our next biggest one, um, sorry, was the purple, if you can see it. And that was um, uh, the great hurricane in, um, <laughs> spacing on the end of it, 2005. Um, Yes, Katrina, <laughs> Hurricane Katrina in, in, in 2005. Everything else was pretty much down in those gray lines, right? <clears throat> so this is an outlier, and we can dismiss it and say that was an outlier year, but what the, the, the new National Science um, Climate Report has told us is that this number may be more the norm by the end of the century because of all these things we've been talking about. Some decades ago, Albert Einstein reminded us of this important truth, that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And I think that's a hard lesson to learn, because I think we're sort of wired to try to do what we've always been doing, but do it better, or do it bigger. And we see this when it comes to water. We try to, you know, we're going to deal with shortage, we're going to build a bigger dam, we're going to divert more water. But that's not going to work the way it worked for the 20th century. It worked very well in many ways during the 20th century, but water's finite, we're tapping it out. And so for all these reasons, we need to sort of think differently, right, about how we use and manage and value and even think about water. And if you think about how we managed water in the 20th century, it was really one of applying the best of our engineering. And again, excellent engineering, right? I mean, you stand in front of Hoover Dam, it's, it's an awesome, awesome thing. Applying the best of our engineering to bring water, control water, in ways that benefited the human economy and human society. You know, water's not always where it's needed, so we had to dam it, store it, divert it. And again, it's hard for me to imagine our world today of 7.8 billion people, $80 trillion economy, global goods and services moving around, without this engineering, without this ability to store and move water. It's hard to imagine. But what does water security look like going forward if we can't do it the same way? And I think the crux of it, and you might have gotten a hint of this, the crux of it is working more in partnership with the natural world and building on, capitalizing on, those services that nature can provide when allowed to do its work. If you reconnect a river to its floodplain, it's going to store water naturally, it's going to cleanse that water naturally, and it's going to provide water for that drought year that might be coming next. What we've seen with the levees that have been built throughout the Mississippi system, again, they've done a great job in many ways of protecting farmland and cities from floods, but what's happening now with the intense rainstorms and the intense flooding is those levees bring the level of the river up and move it downstream faster. So you're getting more potential damage of flood downstream. So even the Army Corps of Engineers is now thinking, we've got to figure out how to move water through the Midwest in a, different, in a different way. And we're not talking about taking the levees down, we're talking about eco-engineering, using ecological science and thought along with engineering and finding a solution that works with natural systems more than we have in the past. And the, and the, and the beauty of this is that where we're seeing this done, it increases the value of water. We're getting more benefits than we, than we thought about. So I think, and we're going to talk a little bit about this um, for the rest of my talk, um, is there are two things, two big things, we need to focus on, right, if we're, going, if we're going to do this and have water security for the rest of this century and beyond. And one is to take a look at our personal and societal water footprint. What do we use water for? How much do we use water for and for what purposes? And figure out how to live you know, happy, healthy, productive lives, but consume less water, shrink that footprint down. And we can do this, we can absolutely do this. And the second thing is, how can we repair and replenish the water cycle? Water is the basis of life. 
we don't have water in our rivers and streams, if we don't have water in our lakes and underground aquifers, we don't have water security. And we don't have the diversity of life that keeps this earth humming. So shrinking our footprint and figuring out how to return some water back to nature. When I was with National Geographic, we started this uh, national water stewardship initiative um, called Change the Course, as we heard this morning in the introduction, or this afternoon in the introduction. Um, and it was really designed to do these two things by bringing the public together, the business community together, farmers and irrigators and ranchers together, and the conservation community together to figure out how we can continue to have healthy economies, healthy productive agriculture, side by side with healthier rivers and, and, and wetlands and ecosystems. And it is working really well through collaboration and innovation and building those bridges and, and working together. We have returned billions of gallons of water to depleted ecosystems. Businesses have stepped up, uh, not only to do more within their own four walls to conserve water and shrink their footprint, but also to give back to nature. We've, we've said to, you know, we've, we've sort of put out the idea that, yes, we need to do as much as we can to grow crops more efficiently, to make those pair of blue jeans in our factories using less water, but also go beyond that and give some water back to the natural world. And that's how Change the Course works. It brings those parties together and conservation groups with shovel-ready projects to return some water to the natural world and make ecosystems healthier get financing to do that from the business community. And so it's been a real win-win, and I'll just share a few stories with you about, about how this works. This is a river in Arizona. It starts um, not too far from the Flagstaff area, Sedona area, and then flows on down, becomes a drinking water supply for Phoenix, um, and then joins tributaries, becomes part of the Colorado River, and then joins the Colorado to flow toward, toward Mexico and the sea which it no longer reaches. Um, but it's, a, it's one of, I would say, the top three rivers in the Southwest for providing excellent riverside habitat for migratory birds. I'm sure many of us enjoy birds in this, in this room. Um, if you're thinking about riverside habitat in the West, that is critical for migra migration of birds. They need habitat, they need water, and they're looking for rivers just like this. And there aren't very many left, right? A lot of those wetlands are gone. And so we began to work uh, uh, with the main players in this, in this river um, to figure out how we can have a healthier river, in this case, side by side with healthier agriculture. If any of you are familiar with how water is managed in the West, it's one of often taking as much water as you can out of the river, right, and using it for productive purposes. So in this case, uh, about a century and a half of irrigation involved taking almost all the water out of the Verde River and putting it in the irrigation ditches and distributing it throughout the valley to the farmers and the irrigators. And so maybe five, six, seven, eight miles of the river would be dry or nearly dry for much, much of the summer. Terrible for birds, terrible for fish, and also not good for recreation in the river. There's not enough water for fishing or for, or for rafting and so on. And so the Nature Conservancy in this case brought in a hydrologist, Kim Shonick from Oregon, to take a look at this situation and say, you know, how can we protect the life that depends on this river? And of course, the irrigators in the valley looked at Kim with great suspicion. She's here to take our water. Well, Kim took a very different approach. She listened, she learned how the irrigation system worked, and she talked with the irrigators about what the possibilities were for allowing them to have as much water as they needed, but to give something to the river. The upshot of it was, this is not rocket science, the upshot of it was putting in a solar-powered head gate, you can see it right here, um, that basically allowed the irrigators to take just the water they needed and to leave the rest there. They had no way of measuring the water before, so they would take it all, distribute it, and you'd have this dry riverbed. This was a simple technology. The ditch boss here, Frank Gaminden, could manage this from a cell phone in his living room rather than getting up at two in the morning to lift the irrigation gate up. 
and it allowed the river to have more flow, in many cases twice as much flow as it had before. And that spawned a whole other range of, of innovations in the valley. This is Zach Hauser, he and his dad farm in the valley, they're the last in line for the water in the ditch system, so if anybody was going to be badly impacted, it was Hauser and Hauser Farms. They had no problem, they were getting all the water they needed even though they were last in line. And then Zach, the younger farmer, decided to shift some of his farms from flood irrigation, where you literally flood the field, to drip irrigation, a more efficient way of delivering water to the crops, where you put in drip lines and deliver water directly to the roots of the plants, allowed more water again to stay in the river. This conservationist, Chip, um, decided to create an incentive for farmers to switch crops from very thirsty alfalfa to much more water-thrifty barley. And he did that by creating a barley malt facility right there in the valley, created demand for barley crops. And barley is harvested later in, in, uh, excuse me, earlier in the year, in the late spring. So it's at a time when the river is not hurting so much. And so that shift in crops also helped to keep more water in the river and gave jobs and boosted the local economy. So this is one example, right, of just smarter management of water putting in a headgate, upgrading the irrigation infrastructure, thinking about how you can manage that system with nature in mind. And you get this triple win out of it. You have a more modernized irrigation system, improved habitat for the fish and the birds, and again, there's hundreds of bird species that depend on this river. And the, and the, <clears throat> the local town, Camp Verde, got more recreation out of it. They're only about an hour or so away from Phoenix, so they now become a destination for recreation, for rafting, for fishing. It helps the local economy. So it was good for everybody, <clears throat> but it took some collaboration, some innovation, and a willingness to trust and, and take some action. And it's, I think, a great example. The, the Verde you'll find now is you know, one of um, the poster childs of river restoration because of this sort of win-win example. How am I doing? Um, I'm going to mention soils because as I was researching this book, I, I realized here I was working on water issues for 30, 35 years, and I myself had not paid enough attention to the importance of the soil as a reservoir for water. Globally, soils hold eight, can hold eight times as much water as all the world's rivers combined. And yet we don't really manage soil as a water reservoir. Farmers are beginning to realize that this reservoir of soil, especially with the increased potential for drought, is becoming an increasingly important supply. And so when you have the industrial-style agriculture with deep plowing, right, you're compacting that soil and, and shrinking the amount of water it can store. And so you have farmers now practicing methods that are designed to improve the health of the soil increase that water storage capacity, and at the same time, provide more resilience to the farming operation. <clears throat> and so if you, the, the science around this has shown that if you can increase, for example, the amount of carbon you store in the soil by even 1%, so go from 3 to 4% carbon in the soil, you might store an extra 20,000 gallons an acre in that soil. And that can build some resilience during during drought. One way of doing that is through cover crops, and that's beginning to catch on. Um, in the U.S. right now, putting cover crops on that land during the off-season, during the winter season, is practiced on only 6% of farmland. But it could help deal with that terrible flooding we had in the Midwest last year. It can help deal with the algal blooms, because that soil is going to capture and hold more of that nitrogen and phosphorus. The state of Maryland, which has been dealing with the algal blooms and the dead zones in the Chesapeake Bay, is actively uh, incentivizing farmers to plant cover crops and has now 29% of its cropland under cover crops during that winter season to prevent wind erosion, water erosion, and that pollution that comes off the land. So this is a great opportunity, again, with, with multiple benefits, um, and, and farmers are beginning to adopt these practices. 
We've talked a little bit about groundwater, and I just want to give you a quick example um, of something innovative happening in California. Um, most of us, if we're eating any fruits and vegetables in the wintertime, are eating right some of the Central Valley groundwater. If it's in our uh, almonds, it's in our fruits and vegetables in the wintertime, much of it coming from the Central Valley. But that groundwater supply has been diminishing. If you look at this chart, um, they've lost about 80 uh, million acre feet over uh, the last several decades. And you know, that supply that's particularly important during the droughts in California is, is going down. So they passed a law in 2014 that aims for sustainability in groundwater by 2040, 20 years from now. And that means taking out only as much water as is going in. Well, how much is going in? That's going to change, right, with rainfall. And so one solution they've added to this is fascinating. It's working with farmers to use farmland in the wintertime, when the farmers aren't growing their crops, to recharge that groundwater. If any of you have been to the Central Valley of California, you know that there's almost no land other than farmland. 90% of the wetlands are gone. So there's no place to sort of do that recharge, right? It's all farmland. But if you can work with farm, farmers, particularly farmers that have um, crops that are dormant you know, during that winter season, and use some of that land as recharge zones, then you can get that groundwater supply coming back up. This is one farmer I met with while I was researching and writing my book, um, who basically uh, allocated five acres of his almond farm to this experiment. And it was a little risky. I mean, if you think about flooding an almond orchard, you know, what's going to happen to the, to the quality of the soil? What's going to happen to the trees? And so there were scientists at UC Davis measuring and monitoring the health of the trees, the health of the soil, um, in, order, in order to assess this. But in this case, the farmers saw some really good benefits. You're going to bank that water for drier times during droughts. You're going to reduce your pumping costs because you're bringing the water levels back up. You're going to reduce the land subsidence that comes from over-pumping your aquifer and so on. And so it seems to be working. Um, in 2017, this kind of active recharge added about 6.5 million acre-feet to local aquifers. That's about enough water for 13 million people in the course of a year. So a significant amount of water. It's not going to solve the problem of depletion, but it's going to help a lot. This uh, Helen Dahlke here is one of the UC Davis scientists that are out in the field measuring uh, the, the impacts on the soil, on the trees, and how much is actually getting recharged, what's happening to the quality of the groundwater as it flows through the soil, and so on. And so far, it seems that the crops are not damaged. The crops they've looked at so far seem to be doing okay. But this is a continuing research effort. Again, would never happen without cooperation among the farmers, the conservation community, and the scientific community. The good news on this is that groundwater costs a whole lot less, groundwater recharge costs a whole lot less than something like desalination, right? If you look at the options for meeting our needs in the future, we want to be cost effective about this, and, and certainly groundwater recharge is cheaper than building a new reservoir or desalinating seawater. What about our urban environment? This is where most of us live. More than half of humanity now lives in in urban areas, and building security in, in our cities is also going to take some really big changes, I think, in how we use and manage water. Let me just give you a couple quick examples here. New York City has become something of a model of watershed protection. If you're a city and you rely on surface water, lake or river water, by law, you have to build a filtration plant as part of your treatment process, unless you can show that you have protected the watershed that supplies your water well enough to meet the drinking water standards. Well, New York City decided to go that route, and they have so far invested $1.7 billion in protecting the forests, working with the forest industry, working with communities, to make sure you have good buffer zones around the reservoirs, to make sure that the runoff is not going to be polluting those drinking water reservoirs, which one of which you can see here. And so $1.7 billion invested has saved $10 billion in terms of what that filtration plant would have cost, and saving hundreds of millions of dollars a year by not having to run that filtration plant. So it's been extremely cost-effective, 
And it's been good in the watershed. You have a healthier, a healthier watershed. We have, we are all part of this unsung uh, uh, success, I would say, in conservation in the United States, and it's continuing. Some of you may remember uh, at the tail end of the first uh, Bush administration, George H.W. Bush, he signed into law as part of the Energy Policy Act in 1993, um, early 93, water efficiency standards that said that all toilets and faucets and shower heads had to meet certain standards of efficiency. And so the plumbing manufacturers had to revise how they, how they made these fixtures. When I was a kid, it took about five or six gallons to flush the toilet, right? Nowadays, you cannot buy a toilet that takes more than 1.6 gallons, and many of them take less than that. And that's because of these efficiency standards. So in effect, we built conservation into our urban and suburban infrastructure. All new homes, apartments, had conservation built into it. So today, we're using 9 billion gallons less per day, every day, because of these initiatives. And we've barely noticed, right? Doesn't really impact our lives very much. And so this has been a huge success um, in, terms of, in terms of this. And, and on, on top of that, there's something called Water Smart, right? Where you can go, if you, if you need a new dishwasher or a new washing machine, you can go and see, this has the Water Smart label. This is a voluntary labeling program, industry loves this, um, that tells you if I buy that machine, it uses water efficiently. So the combination has been very, very effective for reducing our water use um, in this country. I'm gonna skip the Boston story and look at stormwater for a second because this is another big area where we're seeing a lot of positive change. If you think about our cities, right? How do you repair the water cycle in the city? The rain is falling on impervious surface. It's very different from falling on soil. You're falling on streets, you're falling on parking lots, you're falling on shopping malls, you're falling on driveways. Rain has nowhere to go but to flood off, right? And that's causing more and more trouble, especially if you think about Houston during Hurricane Harvey, especially during these really intense storms. So more and more cities are starting to adopt what we call green infrastructure projects, putting in rain gardens, putting in what we call vegetated swales, which you can see on that picture on the right, that little depression along the sidewalk there that captures the rainwater and allows it to recharge into the ground. So it's good for reduced flooding, it's good for re replenishing soils and aquifers. We have more and more green roofs, I'm sure you've seen them, where you have gardens on top of roofs that are capturing rain and then growing, growing some crops, permeable pavement. So these are really interesting, innovative ways of dealing with our flooding problem and our, and our problem of uh, the combined sanitary um, and, and sewer overflows that we see. If you're interested in this topic, take a look at what China is doing. The, the president of China got up and said, we're going to have in this country sponge cities. We want our cities to op operate more like sponges, absorbing water, holding water, and then gradually releasing water. Because China has this dual problem of big floods, big droughts, big floods, big droughts. And they see that if they can retain more of the storm water through green infrastructure, they can build resilience to those floods and droughts. Los Angeles has a goal now of cutting its water imports in half. Calif uh, Los Angeles, California relies a lot on imports of water from the Colorado River and imports of water from Northern California. And it's saying, we don't think that water's gonna be there in the future. Look at what's happening to the Colorado, it's drying out. And so they're saying we want to become more self-sufficient, more resilient. So all of these things we've been talking about, conservation, groundwater recharge, uh, green infrastructure, is a big part of LA's plan to become more self-sufficient and reduce its dependence on imported water by half. I just wanna end with, a, with two thoughts. And one is that this is a very personal thing we can all become a part of. If we wanna be part of the solution, we've talked about how much water it takes to, 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 to hold our lifestyles up. It takes about 2,000 gallons a day if we're an average American. Most of it in our diet. Everything in this room, right, 
took water to make. So this is not to feel guilty about it or anything, it's just to say there's a lot we could choose to do if we want to be part of the solution. You know, I can look at, do I really need 26 t-shirts? You know, it takes 700 gallons to make a t-shirt. Probably not. Um, so we, there's a lot that we could do. We, we can avoid food waste. Every time we waste food, we're wasting all the water it took to make the food, right? So at the personal level, there's, there's a lot we can do. And I think as a society, I want to put this out to you um, because we have been talking about, about stewardship and, and what that means. And I grapple with this because what, what does stewardship mean in this, in this world today? Um, and what would a water ethic be that we could sort of adopt as a society and, and, and sort of guide us going forward in terms of our water management? And I guess if I were to put some language to it, and I'll just leave you with this for, for your thought, um, is something like this, to provide all living things with enough water before some get more than enough. That's how we would implement sharing, right? That's how we would protect what's here, um, the diversity of life on the planet. Water is life. That's the most fundamental thing we can say about water. If you read my book, you'll see something interesting about it. I do not use the phrase water resource. I don't use that phrase. Here's a water book, 300 pages long, whatever. You won't see me using the word water resource. Because to me, that's an abstraction. We're talking about a river, a living entity. We're talking about a river that provides life. We're talking about a lake. We're not talking about a resource. That immediately puts it into a framework that it's there for me to take and use. I think we need to be mindful, right, that these are living, ent these are living ecosystems that support life. And yes, we need to use them as resources, but fundamentally, water is the basis of life. I think if we start from that point, we have an ethic of stewardship that we can build around. So I'm going to stop there, and thank you so much for your attention, and hopefully we have time for a few questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. You're great. My name is Rick Truer, and I'm the Director of Alumni Community Relations here at Kelvin, and we will be taking questions by email and Twitter, and if you have a card, you can hold that up and it will be brought to the front. I'm going to start with a question from a viewer in Grand Junction, Colorado, wondering what is one next step, step in water conservation at an international or national level that is needed but has not yet been taken? One step that is needed but has not yet been taken. Um, gosh, there's so many. Uh, you know, I would say, um, I think one step that is needed um, is a very tangible one to recognize the finiteness of water. You know, we, we, we tend to, um, use it and manage it as, as if it is this limitless resource. And so I think one step that could be taken, and it would apply to a lot of different things, is to essentially say that we have to have a cap, right, on water use. If it's finite and we need water for ourselves, for our food production, and for the natural world, and we say, okay, we're only going to take this much out of this particular river. That forces us to be very creative about how we use that water. It forces us to use it more efficiently. It forces us to um, conserve it, right? And, and I think when we've seen that done in the few places where it's been tried, it does foster a whole range of creative responses. And so I think, I think that recognition and putting in place that kind of, a, of an idea would, would be really helpful for generating a lot of innovation around water. According to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the Great Lakes hold 84% of North America's surface freshwater and about 21% of the world's supply. Many people listening to you today are dependent on the Great Lakes for their water. Lake Michigan is at record high levels. What do you recommend as steps to take us, to help us not take this abundant source of water for granted? I know you mentioned the calculator. Are there other ways that we could become more aware? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the Great Lakes are a phenomenal, uh, you know, set of water bodies on, on the earth. I mean, so lucky to live near such a 
bountiful um, water source. Um, I didn't say resource, water source, right? Um, but again, think about our footprint because, um, you know, it, does, it almost doesn't matter where, it does, it does matter where you live, but if you think about what you're eating, what you're wearing, what you're, very little of that is coming from Lake Michigan, right? Um, I had a cup of coffee this morning. Uh, I don't know where the beans were made, but they were probably made from East Africa, maybe Ethiopia, maybe Guatemala. Um, and so my personal footprint today had some impact on a country very far from me. And that's sort of an interesting thing to think about, you know, that every day through our products, we're connected to rivers and lakes all over the world, in addition to the one that's right next door. Um, and so, again, it's not to be guilty about this. My gosh, my beans were made in West Africa or Ethiopia or Guatemala, but it's to be aware that this connects us all, you know, that we, we have some responsibility and some interest in the water sources that are quite far from us, and that the trade of food is really a trade of water when you think about it. You had mentioned uh, desalination in your talk and about some of the costs involved, but I've had several questions come in wondering if desalination is a solution for the water shortage and what is being uh, done to improve technologies for desalination? Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, so desalination, I'm sure most of you know how it works. There are two ways to do it. You can either um, you know, basically distill water and the salts stay behind and the fresh water comes out of it. You can use a steaming process. That's the old school. The new way is, is really using reverse osmosis membranes. You push seawater uh, through the membrane and the salt, water, the salt is left behind. The fresh water is on the other side of the membrane. And those membranes have gotten very good. They're, they've improved a lot. Um, the thing with, with desalination is that it's very energy intensive. Um, and so it takes a lot of energy to run that process. And again, as the membranes have gotten better, the energy use has, has reduced as well, but it still takes quite a lot. So it's, it's expensive and it's energy intensive, which means you're gonna be contributing to the climate problem as, as you use it if fossil fuels are your source. Um, but third, there's also a toxic brine that's left behind. And that often gets discharged back to the marine environment. And if you talk to fisher folks that are in those areas, that can have a harmful effect on, on the fish and the marine life. And so, so there are consequences to, to desalination. Now, if you're in the Middle East and there's no river, there's no other source, that's gonna be an important source of drinking water. Right now, desalination accounts for less than 1% of all the water we use, okay? And that's, you know, that's, that's a small amount. So it's, it's not a silver bullet in any way. And I think the important thing is when you run out of water, before you move to desalination as your solution, ask what else we can do. You know, we've barely scratched the surface on conservation and efficiency. Um, so before we go that route of a very, you know, energy intensive, expensive desal plant, let's ask what else we can do that might avoid that cost. Um, so it's an important technology, it's gonna be growing but let's kind of evaluate when and where we really, really need it so that we don't have to depend on it too much. I've had a lot of questions come in about bottled water and about concerns in particular about, <laughs> about um, companies coming in and taking water from aquifers or from our resources and shipping them elsewhere. Um, any ways that you would suggest uh, people could become active in helping to prevent that or are there pricing strategies that could be implemented to help reduce or the use of bottled water? Yeah, uh, so bottled water. Um, you know, in most places in this country, tap water is, 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 is very safe, very good. Obviously, if you're in Flint, Michigan, you may have, have an issue. In Newark, New Jersey, you may have an issue. Parts of other parts of this country, you may have an issue and may need bottled water to have safe drinking water. But in most cases, the water coming out of our tap is very safe, and it's regulated differently than bottled water. Bottled water is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, and it's less well regulated than our tap water, okay? And so what you really are looking for, most people, I would say, are looking for, is the convenience, right, of, of having 
a bottle of water. So if you can carry your own bottle um, and drink out of that, that's, what, that's, I think, the way to go, right? That you don't have the plastic pollution, um, the energy it takes to make that plastic, um, and, and, and you have tap water that's, that's regulated by your, that's managed by your local utility, regulated by the EPA, and is usually safe to drink. Um, so, so I think in, in part it's looking at our demand and what we really want bottled water for. Um, now, if I'm going to you know, say that, well, I think it's better to drink bottled water than say sugary you know, sodas or whatever. So there's the health side of it too. But I think it's, it's the convenience of having some water with you and there are other ways, other ways to get that. Um, in terms of you know, regulating the companies, I think they're... Um, you know, we've made some, some exceptions, and the Great Lakes Compact, by the way, is, I think, one of the premier international agreements um, around freshwater protection that's occurred in, 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 in my time, and really something to applaud, that you have, you know, the, the provinces in Canada, the Great Lakes states coming together to protect the Great Lakes. And at the time, you may remember, China was looking at diverting water out of the Great Lakes, putting it in tankers and bringing it to China. Everybody wants the Great Lakes water, right? Um, so this idea of no diversion, I think, is a very positive, and it's that cap I was just talking about at the beginning that sets a cap. No, I'm sorry, this water is needed for the Great Lakes. This water is needed for the ecosystem here. It's not, you know, it's not up for grabs in a sense. And I think that's a very positive statement to make. Um, but exceptions were made for, you know, exports of small quantities, i.e. bottled water, you know, and I think, um, I think that's something to, to look more carefully at. Um, a lot of these bottled water companies want, you know, the, the branding benefit of having, you know, a spring source or, a, you know, a, a particularly clean source, but that can have detrimental impacts on on that source. So I'm talking about a lot of different aspects of this, um, but clearly the companies are meeting a demand. So if we can personally decide we don't really need as much bottled water, there'll be less of a demand to exploit those sources as well. So I'll leave it at that, but I'm open to your thoughts on that because it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, thanks. And I also just want to mention that um, a former Kelvin professor, Congressman Vern Ehlers, he helped write that Great Lakes um, oh, compact great. to uh, mm. protect that water. So mm. um, That's great. that is all the time we have for oh, today. No. But uh, I too long. <laughs> Sandra okay. will be available for questions and for autographs out in the back. Thank you. So. Thank you.